Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Lazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we will try to talk to you about the telenovela that is happening actually at the EU Commission with the, the EPSCO meeting, with the update of the, the extension of the transition period for the EU MDR. And now we receive beginning of January the proposal. And I have with me Eric Volbrecht, who will be helping us to understand all these situations. So hi, Eric. I'm on here. Yeah, it's a telenovela, at least. Uh, at, uh, at, uh, definitely. So uh, as they would say in a good telenovela, no puedo con tanto. It's too much for me to take. And that's really, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complex uh, little thing, this, uh, this proposal, because uh, I've, I've been having a lot of discussions with people and other people have also been having lots of discussions with people. And you can really see that it's, it's, it's not as, uh, let's say, uh, uh, unambiguous as you would think what they uh, what they uh, wrote down in the end yeah and and uh, even uh, if i if i may say when we re read it read the proposal that they are making some people understand something some others understand other things so it's oh, yeah. making really the thing really complicated sometimes yeah, maybe we'll get to that later, but also I apparently misunderstood something that you could read the way I thought I would read it. And then it turned out that the commission had already told somebody else that uh, this was the wrong way, way to read it. So well, it's good to have this, this, these, this guy, these kinds of discussions at this point, rather than that you get a big, uh, that you get a big nasty surprise because, uh, uh, because you interpreted it wrong after the, the law is in force. Great. So let's uh, let's try to clarify the situation. So first, maybe for the people that are uh, joining. So we have had the previous episode in December where we talked about the EPSCO meeting. But um, if we can summarize uh, quickly, uh, Eric. So uh, what happened in December at the EPSCO meeting, and what what's now? Then we can talk now about the situation today. Yeah. So basically, what happened in December was there was another EBSCO meeting, right? So these these are meetings that the, uh, the the ministers of health of the member states have twice a year. So every presidency has an EBSCO meeting, and in the EBSCO meeting of the the first EBSCO meeting in 2022, the Commission was given a mandate to come up with a legislative solution for the uh, MDR notified body capacity problem. So, of course, everybody's like, Ooh. yeah, exactly. In December, uh, you know that well in advance when these meetings are scheduled. So we will see a proposal of the European Commission. And uh, it's really nice. In the meantime, the MDCG was also active. Eh? They first issued the uh, MDCG 2022-11, uh, in which they hinted at uh, some kind of uh, notified body uh, uh, um yeah, solution from the MDCG. Uh, and they didn't really say what legal basis they would use for that. Later, yeah. we got the um, MDCG 2022-14 uh, uh, position paper, which was much broader because that basically that was the famous 19 points paper that, that yeah. rolled out the whole strategy to basically utilize notified body capacity better. And that also gave us uh, more of an insight in the uh, uh, in the Article 97 uh, strategy, which was then fully deployed in MDCG 2022-18. So you really see that the MDCG worked towards it in steps. Uh, and that was like a, a full, uh, yeah, basically manual on how to work with uh, how to work with Article 97 exemptions and when can you get them. So that happened in parallel to this uh, legislative proposal. Everybody expected that the proposal would be actually made at the 9 December EBSCO meeting, which did not happen. Uh, the only thing that happened at the EBSCO meeting was that the uh, uh, commission um, sent in a briefing note for the council, uh, which sort of outlined the proposal, but in the end, there was no actual proposal at the EBSCO meeting. And the commission said that EBSCO meeting, we will make a proposal early January, which they did. On 6 January, we had this uh, this proposal. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's where we are now. And the proposal, it was kind of funny because right after the EBSCO meeting, I saw a bunch of consultants already shouting like, oh, we have an official proposal. No, wrong. We have 
absolutely zero nothing. We have some intention of the European Commission, of which we don't even know it's going to happen. But anyway, so 6th uh, January, we had our uh, proposal. And this is really, yeah, that's that's what it is now. It's a proposal uh, to, to, to change the law to fix the um, notified body uh, capacity problem by copying basically the solution that was used last year uh, to amend the IVDR. So yeah, that's exactly. a, a stacked grace period. So we've got basically two grace period. Uh, well, actually, we have um, three now. Three grace periods. Yeah, yes, we were uh, pre-discussing that. So there's, there's so, the so, so so in terms of in terms of the the proposal. So mainly, uh, they said that they will propose something. So in the sixth of January, we have that now. Mm -hmm. um, they send it to everyone. If I can say it for all of you, um, was there for you after you read it? Was there some kind of surprises or was yes, it exactly what you were expecting or what's exactly well, yes yes and no um basically i i had already predicted summer last year that um uh, i would yeah basically i expected that the proposal would copy uh basically the methodology of the ivdr of stacked grace periods by risk class which yeah. is completely what happened why was it very easy to predict? Because the commission always only yeah, basically uses solutions. If they need to do something similar, they will always use a solution that they already have. Yeah. Uh, and, and also it would be weird to do something completely different for the MDR than for the IVDR. Uh, so uh, that's why they went with this. But put a pin in that because, um, because now we have uh, stacked uh, grace periods. And so uh, basically what the proposal does is it does a number of things, um, some of which surprised me and some of which didn't surprise me. So what didn't surprise me was they uh, we now have stacked risk-based uh, grace periods. So you have one grace period for uh, normal medical devices, uh, so class 3 and class 2B implantables until... 31 December 2027. And then for all the other devices, depending on how you read the proposal, including sutures, dental yeah. crowns, and so on, but maybe we'll address that, that controversy a bit uh, later on. Yeah. Um, uh, and all these other devices are until uh, 31 December 2028. So that was the first big surprise for me. Why on earth? 31 December. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we had only the 26th of May for all the other dates, exactly. even for yeah. IVDR, yeah. and now it's 31st of December. I say, why that? But yeah, okay. Why? Yeah, probably because they wanted to basically give maximum time uh, within those days. Okay, fine. Then there was also uh, another surprise. There was the third, uh, third grace period you yeah. can say, uh, adopted under the proposal, and that's the grace period for class three custom-made devices, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, basically, if you think about it very logically, it's good that they include it because for class three uh, uh, custom-made devices under the MDR, you also need a, a, a notified body involvement. So they, but then what they did, and that was weird, um, that grace period is until 26 May, so not 31 December, 2026. Yeah. So why the why the incongruency in dates beats me? I have no idea. So then then basically we are stuck with uh, three grace periods for different categories of devices. And um, we have not. I mean, um, on IVDR we had just the end of the grace period to say the 26th of May 2027, 26th of May 2028, etc. But here there are some conditions also. You don't think that you can go through those grace periods without following certain conditions. So can we summarize quickly what are those conditions? Sure. Yeah, that was also, you could say, on the one hand, it was a surprise. And on the other hand, it was also kind of logical. Uh, why was it a surprise? Well, because the way they wrote it down. Uh, why was it not a surprise? Because the, uh, the MDCG... Uh, has basically been saying from the start and also the commission in the uh, uh, briefing note for the EBSCO meeting 
that what they wanted is they did not want to reward companies that have been sitting on their hands. Okay. Right? So basically, that means that this um, uh, that this um, uh, whoever thinks now like oh 2027 that is my day to aim for or end of 2027 or end of 2028 no because uh, the um, because the uh, the exemption uh, uh, or the, the the extension is conditional and it's conditional upon companies um, having. Uh, taken clear steps to uh, phase into the NDR by 26 May 2024, the original uh, expiry date of the grace period for the NDR. So basically, what they say, okay, you get more time to go to the not uh, to go through the conformity assessment process with the notified body, but by uh, 26 May uh, 2024. You need to have uh, you need to have done several things. You need to have a, a formal application uh, for conformity assessment in the works with the notified body. You also need a signed agreement with the notified body. And this is important because what I often find with clients is that they don't really understand when they are really, uh, let's say, in the procedure with the notified body, when the conformity assessment procedure has started. Because they think maybe uh, when they send the proposal, they, uh, they send the application form for them, it's fine. Exactly. It's okay, we have we have ticked off this process, no? Yeah, yeah. or, or uh, when they are talking to the salespeople of a notified body, for example, they think that they are already, just because they are talking to a notified body and a notified body says, yes, we have time, we can do this then and then, this is the planning. But if you don't have an agreement signed then, and you haven't put in your application, you still don't meet these requirements. So that is one, that is one let's say, uh, 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 double-edged requirement. Okay. Then there's also um, the new interesting thing that this application needs to concern the legacy device mm -hmm. or an intended substitute. Okay, what does it mean? Interesting. So when is something an intended substitute? Okay. Uh, nobody knows. How are there is you no definition? <laughs> There's no definition. So how are you going to determine if a particular device is an intended substitute for the legacy device? Does it need to be equivalent by the definition of equivalence? Doesn't say so. So basically, yeah, this is still intended substitute. Yeah, this is anything goes on that point. Then um, there are other conditions, um, other new conditions, because mind you, the old Article 120, Section 3 conditions that were already there, they remain. So yeah. no significant changes. You have to do PMS, PMCF, Economic Operators, Vigilance Reporting, and the whole shebang. Uh, and continued compliance with the directive. So that was also that you still need to do. And then there are two other new criteria. Um, and that is also something that, yeah, I mean, it's uh, you always wonder how these people come up with these things. So there is the there's the criterion that the devices should not present an unacceptable risk. Yeah. Right? That's basically an article 97 criterion. Exactly. Um but who is going to look at that? Who knows? Because, yeah, I... because the problem is that if you meet these criteria, of which we don't know who is going to assess that, then automatically, by law, you get the extension. Right? So, so, so basically, here you could be challenged, exposed by a competent authority, maybe by a notified body, we don't know. Where they say, "Hey, but uh, your device is actually not an, an uh, is actually an unacceptable risk," and then your exemption is gone. Hey, just a second. Do you need a EU, Swiss, or UK representative? Then choose Easy Medical Device. We can represent you and also become your importer. Contact us at eo at easymedicaldevice.com. So, does it mean that um, all those criteria? 
as, as, as actually for the moment, we have some notified bodies that have some certificates available with those custom, uh, with those manufacturers. Um, if those certificates will be canceled or not, I suppose it depends on these criteria. So does it mean that you have to submit no, those criteria to notified bodies or? No, it's not so much the cancellation of the certificate that depends on it, but the validity of the exemption. Okay. And the valid and and that's that. But it's a, it's a good it's a good um, it, it's a good point because um, uh, I've also had discussions with people that say, yeah, who determines that the exemption applies? Does the notified body need to issue a new certificate or a letter or whatever? Exactly, because it says on the proposal, I think it says that there is no need for issuing a new certificate exactly. for notified body. So exactly. but what, what is what is the proof that yes, you are on this extension now? Nobody knows. Okay. And this, and, and this is this and this is also why it is super tricky if you need a field uh, if you need a a free sales certificate or if you uh, have to deal with competent authorities uh, in in other ways because uh, in, in other uh, jurisdictions because how are you going to prove to them that um that you still have a valid certificate yeah because when you are asking for your free sales certificate they ask you to provide the ce certificate that should yeah. be valid normally, plus uh, some declaration of conformity, some documents. So then the competent uh, authorities yeah. are reviewing that, and then they accept to create a free sale certificate too, so that you can sell your products uh, other countries. So now, what is the mechanism within the competent authorities to say, uh, okay, this certificate is expired, but it's still valid? So it's mainly something that, or it's extended, but this yeah, is mainly so something that, that, so that, 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 that means that they are going to have to train foreign competent authorities, so non-union competent authorities, on this is how you can recognize that the certificate is actually still valid. Yeah, no, I think it's a, a tricky, tricky yeah, point. It's very valid. tricky because already the the uh, already the uh, uh, the grace period under the uh, with the uh, with the continued validity of this of the MDD certificates and the AI and MDD certificates already posed a lot of problems. With competent authorities in other countries and this is going to just be uh, way worse so in terms of um, um so we we had also this a lot of question about this but what is the situation now if my product already expired for example i have a, a certificate that expired december 2022 and i'm so actually i'm i hope hoping for the article 97 that we have seen the mdcg 2022-18 but if by miracle, if I can say the this proposal is now approved and that we, it's voted, does yeah. it mean that my certificate is now fine as long as I'm following those those uh, requirements that they are mentioning those uh, those elements? So does it mean that now it was expiring in December? Now by maybe February, if uh, the vote is done, it's can it's it's still alive. Mm -hmm. Well, there is there is uh, there is a proposed provision that says that uh, certificates that have already expired relive, uh, they become valid again. But there's a hard condition that uh, you uh, already had an agreement signed with uh, a notified body um, with respect to the device covered by the expiry, uh, by the uh, expired certificate, or in respect again. Uh, in respect of a device intended to substitute that device, which is what is interesting about this requirement is that there, the only requirement is you've signed an agreement with the notified body and not that the conformity assessment procedure was already underway. So okay. that's the difference. Yeah. And then there are two other things that happen in the proposal as well, one of which uh, was not surprising to me. Uh, that was the removal of the sell-off period. Yeah because I expect it for the NDR. So basically um, that means that the uh, yeah Article 120, Section 4 is removed. Uh, and Which that was to stop to, to stop selling MD legacy products by the 26th of May, 2025. Yeah, 27th May to be precise. Um, and uh, so now there's basically an eternal sell-off period. So yeah. whatever you've placed on the market when uh, your certificate was still valid, you can sell off until 
eternity. So I don't know if you have a medical device that's like, I don't know, a steel brick or something, which doesn't expire. Yeah, I mean, go crazy, produce as much as you can, and then you can sell it off until uh, eternity. Exactly. Which is also weird because that basically means that we are going to be stuck with uh, in this transitional limbo for a long, long time because we'll be seeing, especially in uh, in orthopedic implants and other, let's say, metal kind of stuff that is not sterilized. We are going to see a lot of devices that are still in their old certificates for a very long time. Exactly. It's but... still placed on the market, which will be very confusing. Exactly. But um, uh, we saw also this surprise for... Um, so this, we, we had that on the discussion on the EBSCO meeting, mm -hmm. but we just discovered also about IVDR on this source. Yes. That was a really funny one because also they decided to remove the uh, sell-off period for the IVDR, just like, whoop, gone. So uh, it's it's strange because I think, as I said, we, we we were really focused on MDR and now they talk about IVDR. So do you think there are other elements that are impacted by this? Uh, I mean, IVDR is impacted by, by this proposal? Uh, no, but uh, I already had the first questions from clients that were worried that now suddenly under the IVDR, they also needed to show a uh, 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 full, fully implemented IVDR QMS by a certain date and okay. uh, needed to have a notified body application and a signed contract before a certain date because they were afraid that this was somehow mirrored in the IVDR as well. But no, it's not. So now we've got the weird situation that the, uh, the, the stacked grace period regime under the IVDR is ridiculously more lenient and under the MDR. Exactly. Now I think it's. Uh, I mean, it's good to to have those kind of uh, information now. And um, we we had also a, a question. I mean, I, we got a question as we mentioned at the beginning about a lot of products yeah. that are like suture staples, dental filling, yeah. dental braces, tooth crown, etc. Those products that are well established technologies. Exactly. So um, when you read strictly the English, if I can say, of the proposal, yeah. you see that. This has no extension of the period, if I can say well, when you read it strictly without really thinking of everything. So this yep. is mainly what, what we think when we are reading that. So yeah, because that's also how I uh well basically misunderstood uh compared to the commission anyway what the proposal said, because uh, I had initially made a flow chart and shared it on LinkedIn in which uh, these well-established technology products were excluded from the whole grace period. Uh, and other people said, no, 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 but they uh, they are in the class 2B uh, products that will go into uh, 2028. But if you, I mean, really, if you read the, uh, the, the proposal closely, then it really depends on how you interpret uh, a certain comma. Exactly. And apparently, that's uh, that's the, the famous uh, Oxford comma uh, discussion. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I'm curious whether they are going to make this more clear because also if you look in the um, in the uh, explanatory text to the proposal, it seems to completely confirm this because it also at some point here. Let me get the uh, text where it says. Where it says, come on, yeah, where they, where they uh, also, where they say, oh yeah, uh, sutures and so on, and then uh, 2028 is for other to be devices. Exactly. But then you think like, okay, so not for sutures and so on, right? Um, and uh, yeah, that was just weird, but uh, uh, apparently some clever people uh, uh, Ask the commission, yeah. Took part in the discussion on LinkedIn, they asked the commission, and the commission said, "No, no, no. It's uh, the, the 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 wet products, the well-established technology products. They are in 2028. So that's good. That's yeah. nice. Good to know that. Except that they didn't write it down very uh, very clearly, exactly. But uh, let's clarify that today, so that uh, you are not afraid, because I know that a lot of manufacturers of those products are we're asking themselves okay are we in trouble now yeah. because we cannot extend our products and, and this and that so 
uh, no, which is scaring people with my wrong flow chart uh, initially. <laughs> but it did provoke a lot of good discussion. I yeah, yeah, I will. I will put the flow chart again on the show notes, so don't hesitate to go and download and that's it. That's the right flow chart, people. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so we have a last thing uh, to talk about, which is the consultation period. So mainly, oh, yeah. um, they decided to uh, make a consultation period um, mm-hmm. until when? Because it was really confused. Uh, we, we are really confused about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, initially it was uh, it was way into March, which right? really was but, strange uh, because they wanted something really quick. So it was strange to go to March. Exactly. So that's also what I thought. Like, okay, so maybe the accelerated uh, co-decision procedure is not so accelerated uh, after all. Okay. Then they removed the link uh, at some point, and then they put it back with a date until 18 January. Okay, so you have still few days. Yes. I mean, when the podcast will be released, it will be around the 17th. Uh, so you have one day after that. So I hope exactly. uh... now today it's uh, Friday the 13th. Uh, it's a very auspicious day for uh, <laughs> and the exactly. discussions. But, so, um, so the 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 comment, if I can say, the consultation is mainly open for everyone, or it's specifically everyone. some people, or what's uh, how it is working uh, this consultation. No, the, the, the consultations are open to everybody, except if you uh, use a lot of uh, four-letter words uh, and, uh, and other swear things in your uh, in your answer, because that's actually part of the uh, part of the rules that you're not allowed to do that. But otherwise, yeah, anybody can uh, can comment. And uh, I, I saw that a lot of people have also commented in lots of different languages, which is always good. But um, then what the commission will do is uh, they will uh, uh, well they will probably look at it and depending on whether it's politically opportune or not they will feed they might feed uh, some of these comments back into the legislative debate but what you should really uh, uh, think about is that this is an oil a proposal like this that needs to be uh, signed sealed and delivered in a very short while because that's really what they aim for uh, it's it's a bit like an oil tanker, so they are. It's not going to change, of course, change course dramatically just because somebody puts in uh, uh, something in the uh, stakeholder consultation. I mean, but if, start- if there are, I suppose, I don't know how it's working, but if there is only one person asking for maybe a comment, maybe it will not be taken into account. But if a lot of people are asking the same comment, does it change something or it changes nothing? Well, it might still not be taken into account because it's 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 not it's not a voting process. Like uh, like should Elon Musk step down as CEO? No, this is like uh, what do you think about this proposal? So it's basically it's a way for the commission to see if they overlooked anything critically. And then, of course, there will be a lot of people with opinions about other stuff that should be in the proposal as well, and whether the proposal works or not. No, no, no. But in the end, they are not obliged to do something with this. They are obliged to consult, and that's okay. what they. Yeah. So yeah, so we must maybe say like ninety percent of chance that all well, ninety nine percent maybe of chance that the proposal that was made will not change too much. No, that's that's a very safe uh, bet. I think um, it might be that uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, for example, the the comma discussion we had just now yeah. it might be that they take out the comma. Okay, that's, that's the kind of changes I would still expect. But uh, otherwise, you can be really certain that if the commission um, uh, makes a proposal for an uh, accelerated co-decision procedure that um, this is not a complete surprise to the other parties and to the other institutional actors in the procedure. So they will only start with a proposal like this if it has already been socialized to the parliament and the the commission. Because the whole idea about an accelerated procedure is, is that there's not going to be a lot of amendments that are going to be discussed in detail. That's the whole idea. So do do we have already like maybe an approximate date when we should expect a change of this law or not at all? Good question. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I also had this question uh, posed to me a couple of times and I went back to look at the uh, the last example we have with respect to the MDR and that's the, the change of the date of application uh, in 2020. 
and then actually they did it really fast because the uh, because the uh, proposal was made formally, went into the procedure on four April. Okay. And the uh, when was it? When was it actually uh, closed again? Uh, yeah, that was like twenty four April. So they okay. did it, they did it in twenty days. So if here we are expecting something similar, so it means mid of February, maybe they will provide something. Yeah, I am. I myself, I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm betting on March, somewhere in March. Normally, when you publish a proposal, a legislative, uh, uh, an amendment in the uh, official journal, you need to. They also need twenty days to um, before it can enter into force. But you can also, uh, in in urgent cases, they can also need that out, which I expect they do. So I would expect this proposal to uh, to enter into force uh, somewhere in March, halfway March, probably. Okay. So now that we have, I can say, this kind of picture, I am a manufacturer. My certificate already expired. <laughs> what what should I do? Should I wait for this March update so that I can, if I can say, revive, uh, have my my certificate go live again, or? Should well, I still go to Article ninety seven, or what's what? What would be your strategy for that? Depends on how formalistic you are as a manufacturer, because uh, if your certificate has expired now, then at the moment there is no legislative instrument that makes it revive or makes it have continued validity. So that means that yeah, you are non-compliant uh, if you place products on the market. And this is typically the kind of situation you could remedy with Article 97. So you could, if you are very formalistic, you could say, or if you want to even be compliant, you could say, we are going to file a, uh, uh, we are going to file a uh, uh, Article 90, uh, 97 application at the competent authority, according to the procedure set out in MDCG 2022-18, uh, and then hope that they are quick. Uh, and also uh, moan and bitch and gripe about the fact that there's a lot of information that has to go in a procedure uh, like this, and then yeah, basically solve the uh, solve the non-compliance this way. On the other hand, if you are uh, a bit more, uh, let's say, less risk averse, you can also say, well, this is this is this my certificate is going to relive anyway if this proposal is adopted. Uh, so, um, what I am going to do is I'm going, and this is also actually unclear in the proposal. What does it mean that the certificate relives? Does it mean that in the period that you mentioned now between expiry of the certificate and entry into force of the proposal, does it mean that, uh, if your certificate relives, uh, relives by the time the proposal enters into force, does it mean that your certificate was considered always valid? Yeah. Or does it mean that, yes, there was a period of non-compliance and then the certificate relives again? Nobody knows. So, so that I... means that, that basically you could be enforced against for this period of non-compliance in case reliving does not mean that it relives with retrospective effect. Exactly. Because that's, that's, that, and that's, that's a difficult one, um, which is not taken care of in the proposal, unfortunately. Exactly, but um, yeah. And these I, are I, the things. We, this, these are actually the things we lawyers worry about. We read a proposal like this and we like, how can you forget this? <laughs> this is stupid. That's this it's is elementary. It's but clear, but uh, I... consultants will say, "Oh, my certificate relives." Yes, great success. <laughs> Nothing more to do. And we will be like, "No, oh, do you know what can happen in terms of product liability for a non-compliant product? This is terrible. How could they overlook this?" No, oh, it's clear. So yeah, as as we said, so uh, Article ninety seven is for now the the best strategy to to go for. Uh, then we'll have, I hope, this proposal that will be signed. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, there is some gray area where uh, yeah we don't really know if um, if there will be any issue or not but yeah and i'm always so surprised that they don't look at things like that i mean it's not like yes there are clever people at the commission that write these proposals but the commission also has a whole legal service that knows stuff like this i mean they should ask those people like 
maybe we should put in something like that so it's clear to the market where they are in terms of compliance exactly but uh yeah. Yeah, I mean, there will be. All, I mean, it was going so quick that maybe, uh, as we said, there are some misses. But uh, we'll 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 see if there is really some problems on, on the market, which I hope they will they will they will avoid. Um, so great! I think now, yeah, we have a full picture. I hope. I mean, we can still have maybe some surprises uh, after the the consultation, but um, I think it will should be fine. So today, you will if you look at this podcast episode today. So normally tomorrow. Uh, there will be the end of this consultation. So go uh, directly to the website. I will try also to put that on the show notes so you can go there and directly uh, con uh, go and put your comments if you have any comments or even read the comments of others because it's public so you can open, read the yeah. comments of others and see exactly what are their concerns because uh, it can be also a, a good learning for from your side. Uh, and then put your comment because even if, as we said, to be accelerated and maybe the proposal will not be um, looked at or not be changed too much, Maybe your 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 comment can help to as a, as we said to remove a comma from the proposal, which change completely the meaning of a sentence. So it could be a really great. Um, Eric, we have uh, still to talk about your book. So you are releasing a book, and we talk tell tell more about that for people that not don't know that you have a book that is released. Oh yeah, well I uh, I wrote a big book which is based. It's called the Enriched MDR and IVDR, which is basically you could say. Um, uh, article by article uh, annotated version of the MDR and the IVDR with the introductory uh, chapter at the beginning and uh, a lot of uh, lot of nice uh, reference tables and so on uh, in uh, in the back and um, yeah it's for sale and uh, you can even get a nice discount uh, on it uh, uh, via Monier's uh, podcast with exactly uh, the uh, with uh, the uh, discount code that Monier is no doubt going uh, to, to mention. Exactly. So it's a medical device 10. So where you will get 10% uh, reduction uh, when you are acquiring this uh, this book. So don't hesitate to take that because mainly uh, uh, it's a kind of a Bible. So if you are in this in this business of medical device regulation uh, or quality, so this is something that can help you to understand some of the elements that are, uh, yeah, um, said if I can say on the regulation, but with a lot of some didactic information there, so it should be great. And you can follow also uh, Eric Volbrecht on LinkedIn. I uh, will also put your blog, so medical uh, device laws. I always make mistakes on this one. Medical so, devices legal. Doctor. Legal. Like I say law, but it's legal. <laughs> medical device is legal, where you can uh, read uh, all the blog posts of Eric with all the references or all the information where you'll have also those uh, those those details there. One okay, of Eric. That proposal is coming, actually. I'm uh, writing that post now. But it's, since there's so many moving parts uh, still, it's... Uh, I thought I shouldn't be the first with this because I will no doubt overlook a lot, which exactly. would have happened. So I'm glad that I didn't write it yet. No problem. So let's uh, let's now follow up on this. There will be, as I said, it's a tele telenovela. So we'll maybe have a, a third episode about this when uh, the publication will be done, and maybe there are some surprises about it. But uh, let's uh, let's look at that and and talk about it again. Okay, Eric. So thank you very much, and I wish you a nice day. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Uh,